Thank you. Okay, thank you. Wow, so many people. Beautiful. Buy a donkey for coming over here. <laughs> okay, that's as much as I know in Afrikaans. I, I must say that I realize upon landing that uh, I'm an ant. I'm not a human. Because in Afrikaans, Amir is an ant. <laughs> And then a lady came to me at the end of the conference, but you must know the ant is a very smart animal. It's, you know, it does, it works hard and it's, and I'm like, why do you convince me that I'm an ant? And no, I'm not. But just so you know, in Hebrew, my name means the uppermost branch of the tree and it's from Isaiah chapter 17. Okay, so um, ant, I am not. <laughs> Such a lovely uh, time um, here in South Africa. Uh, you cannot be more hospitable than what I see here. It's, it's amazing. Um, all of us have gone through some very challenging years in the last couple of years, two, three years. And I know that... Uh, it's finally time to breathe a little bit and to sit at the, uh, in setting that was so familiar to us before. And uh, this evening, I would like to share with you a message called the Days of Ezekiel. The day we sang about Days of Elijah. We also mentioned the Days of Ezekiel. And uh, I didn't match the message to the song, but uh, it happened to be so. And... Um, you know, just three hours ago, before this uh, uh, you know, evening started, we got some very disturbing news from Russia, and that is the Russians are intending to dissolve the work of the Jewish agency, which means Jewish people in Russia will not be able anymore to apply to immigrate to Israel. 165,000 Jews are still stuck in Russia, and the Russian Ministry of Justice is asking to dissolve their uh, presence there. It sounds bad. It also sounds bad to see, or looks bad to see, Putin holding hands with Raisi and Erdogan and, and all the plotting that they do behind the back of Israel. It also sounds bad to hear that the Russians are not allowing us to strike in Syria. It also sounds bad to know that they are sending subtle threats to Israel um, in many different various channels. And you know, when you think about it, things could look pretty bad if you only look at things from a worldly, earthly perspective. This is also the, the case here in South Africa. If you only look at what is going on in the country without the ability to take two steps backwards and see the full plan of God, we can actually fall into depression. Sometimes the bad times are not as bad as we think they are. You know, a biblical perspective, of course, is essential. And of course, we need to always remember that the Bible is calling us to understand the times and the seasons to understand we need an understanding of the times and the seasons in order to be able to stay with a smile on our face and to serve the Lord diligent we need to understand the times and the seasons in which we live I want to remind you that 2,000 years ago for a group of 12 disciples and the women that were with them, it was way worse than it is for any of us today. They've witnessed a weekend from hell that started with the illegal trial in the nighttime before the Sanhedrin, after the Passover Seder was over, and it ended up with a terrible death penalty to the one whom they thought 
is about to reign and rule from Jerusalem over the whole world. They saw their dreams, they saw their hopes shattered to pieces before their very eyes. It was a terrible weekend. And in Hebrew, weekend means the end of the week. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> Sunday is not a weekend. In Hebrew, you call it Sunday, I'm not sure why. I guess you have some issues with the sun. <laughs> and then Monday with the moon. But in Hebrew, we call it first day. Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. The only day that has a name is Shabbat, Sabbath, because it's the word to cease from working. But it's the only day God asked us to name something that is not just a number. So on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now they are in tears. They are sad. They are depressed. They are embarrassed. They just lost their king, their messiah, their leader, their rabbi. They are actually going to a tomb with, with what? With spices. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed because they couldn't find the body that behold two men stood by them in shining garments. And then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee saying the son of man, say the word must must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Jesus didn't just say that it's going to happen. He said that it must happen. And they did not believe. And so it's very interesting because we know that the men then later on ran and found that the tomb is empty and we know that you know nobody was dancing, nobody was happy, nobody was making any Shouts of joy. Nothing. In fact, we know that because the Bible says that behold, two of them, two of the disciples were traveling that same day. Sunday, first day of the week. Same day. They were traveling out of Jerusalem. Why? They wanted to run away. Why normally are we running away from something? To distance ourselves from that something. They wanted to go to a village called Emmaus. So it was while they conversed and reasoned. Jewish people love to converse and reason. And we do it with our hands. Tie our hands behind our back, we can't talk. <laughs> so while they conversed and reasoned, what is it that they had to reason for? about well, what is it that they had to talk about they were talking about the events of that weekend and they were not happy remember it's sunday morning remember the tomb is empty and they are not happy that's probably the state of the church today tomb is empty it's still empty i came from jerusalem tomb is empty And so many Christians are angry, sad, disappointed, having anxiety and fear and embarrassment. <laughs> and so the Bible says that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. <laughs> and when was the last time you went to a funeral and on your flight back home, the guy that you buried is sitting next to you? <laughs> Well, Jesus is walking right by them. Their eyes were restrained, so they could not know him. But he said to them, look what he says. That means he listened. That means he knows what they're talking about. Not only what they're talking about, what they're thinking. 
He said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are what? Sad. Jesus saw two disciples that heard that he was resurrected and they are sad. He says, what is it? And uh, immediately, the one whose name was Cleophas answered and said, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? And I love Jesus' question. What things? <laughs> what things? And then they continued, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Isn't that lovely to hear about yourself? <laughs> Who was a prophet. Past tense. That's it. They're done with him. He was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. That's it. It probably wasn't him. We wasted three years on this guy. <laughs> Thinking about Peter who left a boat full of fish. <laughs> Indeed, besides all this, now, not only that they're telling him that he is no longer an option, but now they're telling him about his resurrection. Indeed, beside all these things, today is the third day since these things happened. And yet certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. And when they did not find his body, they came saying that, that, that they, had not, they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. Women, you were right. What can I say? But the man had to go and check that you were right. <laughs> and it's funny. The two disciples said, but him they did not see. They're telling Jesus that Jesus was not in the tomb. You know, if you could add something, you could add the, the, the word da. I mean, he's standing right there talking to them. Of course he's not in the tomb. And the Bible says, and that's Jesus speaking to his disciples, not speaking to the Pharisees, not speaking to the Sadducees, not speaking to the Romans, speaking to his own disciples. Saying, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart, to believe in how many prophets? All the prophets have spoken. There's one thing Jesus identified in the way they behave is that whenever the prophets were read in the synagogue regarding the death and the suffering and the resurrection of the Messiah, they never believed a word. Do you really think that Jesus fulfilled the word of God and it was not written? Everything was written. In fact, the Bible says that, and he did that so it might be fulfilled, which was written. And just so you know, Jesus was not a Christian. But before you stone me to death, Christ cannot be a follower of Christ. He is the Christ. Okay? So Jesus never was a Christian. And Jesus, just so you know, not even one time quoted the New Testament. Forget about Jesus. Peter and Paul never quoted the New Testament even once. Why? Because there was no New Testament yet. And yet the whole first century, they led thousands and thousands to the Lord by what? The scripture of that time was the Old Testament. 
Don't tell me that without the New Testament you cannot lead someone to Christ. When the first century did not have it. Now I'm not saying the New Testament. New Testament is the best thing that ever happened to us. But it was foretold in the old. And he said to them, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And look what he did. And that is the... If I get to heaven tomorrow and I have to see Jesus and ask him for something, I want the notes of this sermon. <laughs> because look, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in what? All the scriptures, the things, the things <laughs> concerning himself. Wow. Isn't that amazing? You see, he basically told them, it's not that bad. It looks bad if you don't believe the words of the prophets. If you only look at circumstances. If you only look at your president or your parliament or your military or your, elect, or your mayors or your, um, I mean, name it. If you put your trust in these things only and you don't understand the full plan of God, you might get depressed. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the prophets consist a third of the Bible. We are the only group of people on planet earth that its holy scriptures contain 30% of future events. And God is not ashamed of doing that because he knows that everything he wrote is going to come to pass. The Bible says, Isaiah 46, remember the former things of old, for I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of what? Scripture. Scripture. No prophecy of Scripture. Today, a lot of people like to call themselves prophets. But no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. God communicated his heart and his plan to his people through his people. Through chosen ones. And oftentimes, by the way, they didn't even want to be prophets. I mean, last time I heard, Jeremiah did not go to school as prophets. God said to him in the first chapter, when you were still in your mother's womb, I already chose you. So what are the days of Ezekiel? Of course, we see so many prophecies of so many uh, prophets being fulfilled before our very eyes. We are the most blessed generation since the time of Jesus Christ. Make no mistake, more prophecies have been fulfilled in our generation's time than in any other generation since the first century. And one of the most amazing prophets that prophesied many things that are actually all around us is the prophet Ezekiel. And it's very interesting because in the 36th chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel basically said, and I speak to you, go back one, and speak to you, O mountains of Israel, yes, Shoot forth your branches and yield my fruit for my people Israel, for they are about to come. God said through the prophet Ezekiel that the day will come when he will gather the Jewish people from the four corners of the world, but the land is dead. Mark Twain shows up in the middle of the 1800s and writes a, 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 a journal where he said that the land was so dead that even the cactus, 
that is a very good friend of the desert left the country, <laughs> migrated out. Nothing was growing there. The mosquitoes were there. The Anopheles mosquitoes that brought malaria. But God stirred the hearts of several Jews and said, my, my children, it's time to leave your comfort zone, wherever you are, Russia, Poland, whatever, and move. And they said, move? Eastern Europe, desert. Eastern Europe, desert. God says, I'm going to speak to the mountains of Israel. And I will tell them, shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel. For they are about to come. And take a look at what God turned this land into right now. Take a look at this one, the next one. It is the same land. The land was dead for 2,000 years. In fact, in the last, last 400 years, the Ottoman Empire didn't develop it, didn't take care of it. Every river turned into a swamp. Every swamp attracted mosquitoes. Every mosquito brought his friend. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and God said, you know, just like the pilot and the flight attendants in preparation for landing, please buckle your seat. In preparation for my bringing back my people, the land must shoot forth its branches. And that's Ezekiel 36. And keep that slide for a second because I want to talk about the next one and then I'll let you know what happened. So, you move to chapter 37. Normally 37 comes after 36, at least in Hebrew. <laughs> and in chapter 37, Ezekiel, the same Ezekiel that received an amazing vision of how God in the very end will gather the Jews from the four corners of the earth. By the way, the Lord told Ezekiel that the Jewish people profaned his name when they were out of their land. And you will ask, how? By the fact that they were out of the land. And the nations said, aren't these God's people and what are they doing outside of their land? It was an offense to God that because of their disobedience, he had to take them out. And now the nations look at God's people out of their land. And God says, I'm going to bring them back so the nations will see that I am God. But then he led Ezekiel to a valley full of dry bones. He said, Ezekiel, look at them. And Ezekiel is looking at them. And those dry bones are saying, our bones are dry, our, 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 our hope is lost, and we ourselves have been cut off. This is how the Jews felt. And the Lord says, speak to them, Ezekiel. Oh, my people, Israel, you are my people. You're not lost. I'm not done with you. I'm going to take you out and I will bring out of your graves, out of European Holocaust graves, I will take you and I will bring you into your own land. And I was trying to think for so long, Lord, what are these dry bones? When is it that you took dry bones out of one area that is out of, of Israel and brought them back to their own land. And obviously, the first thing that came to my mind is that picture, as you can see right now, when the Allied forces came and liberated the death camps in Europe. He, they literally found tens of thousands of skin and bones people with no hope in their eyes, thinking that God has completely forgotten about them. And it's that generation that God took out and he rescued them, the remnant. And, and when he rescued them, look how he brought them back in so many different ways. By ship, 
by air, some of them by foot. Take a look at the next one and see for yourself. The Jews began to return by the hundreds of thousands back to their land in an act unparalleled history. Never before a nation was restored 2,000 years after they were out of their land, out of, I mean, away from their language and culture. Everything was foreign, and yet God brought them back. You, I mean, we, Israel is the only country on planet earth that is searching and looking and bringing people into its territory. Most countries get out. <laughs> How can we help you to leave, <laughs> most countries? Israel has absorption centers. In fact, one of the missions of the Israeli secret service, the Mossad, and trust me, I know them, is to facilitate the return of the Jews back to their land. And this is why in order to allow Ethiopians into this 747 from Sudan, and a Mossad operation had to precede that. And in the middle of the desert, there has to be an interesting man-made landing strip for airplanes that would land in the dark. All the seats were taken out and a thousand Ethiopian Jews were crammed into one 747. And just so you know, when they landed back in Israel, it was a thousand and one because a baby was born on board. And they were very slim, as you can clearly see here. No milk tart over there. And, and so you know, they brought them back in the 80s and they brought them back in the 90s. And that's, that's actually late in history. What about those who survived the Holocaust and made it through those big ships like this? My grandparents survived the Holocaust in, in Poland, made it to a, an Italian coastal city, board a boat, traveled two weeks to the sea, my, my mother, uh, my grandmother was already pregnant, advanced pregnancy. And they, she saw the land. They were so happy. And then the British police turned around this ship and sent them to Cyprus to a detention camp. And my mother was born in a detention camp in Cyprus. If that's not enough, up until today, and you're going to hear more about it today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, God is doing his business of returning the Jews back to their land. And trust me, even Vladimir Putin cannot stop him. So the preparation of the land in Ezekiel 36 fulfilled. The, the, the rescue of the remnant in Ezekiel 37 and the return to the land fulfilled. And what is the next chapter after 37? Okay, let's see. 38. A chapter that speaks of Israel being a country that is safe and secure and prosperous. Ezekiel 38 is not a country that was just born. It's a country that people wants to take everything it has. Ladies and gentlemen, we have become in the last 30 years somewhat superpower in some areas. Water, for example. Do you know that Israel, take a look, this is from 2017, the world's leader in water reclamation with 87% of its wastewater undergoing purification and reuse for agriculture. Folks, I was taken to a farm in Israel. And the lady was very nice. She hosted me and the team. And she showed me a pool full of clear water. She said, guess how deep it is. I thought three feet. Or, you know, one meter. She said, no, it's ten meters deep. It's so clear you can't see it. She said, wow. She said, taste the water. I'm tasting the water. I said, very good. She said, yeah, good. Because I just flushed the bathroom. And it's a... <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, w w what did you just say? She said, no, that's how it works here. 
We flush the bathroom, the toilet. The water goes, wastewater goes to a pool. We carefully select water plants above to start cleaning the water. Then they move to a lower pool with different water plants that are cleaning even more. Then to a third one that clean even more. And by the time it gets to the end of the third one, the water is pure and ready to be uh, uh, drunk. <laughs> Quite amazing. And then she said, you can try again. I said, no, no, I'm okay. I'm not thirsty anymore. <laughs> I believe you. <laughs> by the way, the embassy of Israel in South Africa mentioned that in, in 2020. Only 25% of Israel's water usage is from natural water resources. Natural water resources like the Sea of Galilee and aquifers have been replaced by man-made water. 26% desalinated water, 23 purified waters, and 14 salt water sources. Unbelievable. What about energy? Energy. That's what the world is talking about today. You know, now people are moving the mask from their face to their eyes when they go to the gas stations. <laughs> they don't want to see the price there. It's too much. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel a few years ago found trillions of cubic feet of natural gas off the, the shores of the Mediterranean. Take a look at all these gas fields. Huge. The minute we found it, Putin was on his plane. Landed in Tel Aviv, we thought he comes to talk about Syria and Iran. When we got the flight manifest of who is on the plane, it was all people from the gas and oil industry. He wanted to do business. We politely declined. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, listen. That was before we even developed it. Now that it's fully developed and we are already selling gas. Listen to who? Who do you think we sell gas to? We are selling gas to Jordan and Egypt. Those who fought to destroy us in 1948 and 1967. Now they depend on us. <laughs> now watch this. So we develop it. We find more and more and more. And we all know. There's more, by the way, more energy sources in Israel. Take a look at the desert in Israel and what it looks like right now. Thousands of solar panels and a tower. And when you look at it, you turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> but truly, at, at this level, Israel generating about 8% of its electricity from solar power plants nowadays. But it sets a goal of reaching 20% of its electricity from solar radiation by 2025 and 30% by 2030. Look, it's hot anyway. Why not making something out of it? Do you know that Israel invented a way to get water from the air? You sneeze, we drink. <laughs> what about food? While farm workers made up only 3.7% of the workforce, Israel produced 90 5% of its own food requirement while the whole world is obsessed with wheat from Ukraine and yes or no we are not that uh, worried <laughs> ladies and gentlemen 10 Israeli companies listed among the top 50 global ag tech food tech firms in 2020 in military you all know Israel is leading in military industry we invented so many amazing innovations I'm not allowed to tell you because then I will have to kill you. <laughs> In absolute terms, Israel has a small military, but with mandatory military service, a large percentage of the Israeli population is militarily ready. With a past history of being surrounded by aggressive neighbors, Israel also has a large tank aircraft and attack helicopter fleet. Israel also has a qualitative military advantages. It has space assets, advanced fighter jets, high-tech armed drones, and nuclear weapons. You never heard the last part. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, but the best thing we have is the human 
part. Today, I posted on, how many of you follow me on Telegram, by the way? Not enough. <laughs> it's uh, all the lower part, yes. Upper part, no. Okay, thank you. So watch this. I posted a, a confession of an Iranian Revolutionary Guard person that he's part of a smuggling group of weapons to Hezbollah and all of that. But guess who interrogated him? The Mossad. Guess where? On Iranian soil. We operate in Iran, and they know that, and they are afraid. It's the people. We have technological advantages, advantages with cyber superpower, potential, endless. And of course, all the countries around us can see it. Now, Ezekiel, look, I'm not just here. I'm not promoting Israel. I'm promoting God. Because honestly, without him, we would have not even been here. God is the one who brought us back to the land. God is the one who spoke life to the dead land. God is the one who rescued us from the, the, the graveyard of Europe. God is the one who brought us physically. And God is the one who is prospering us. And the countries around are watching. Russia. The Bible talks about in Ezekiel chapter 38. Gog of the land of Magog. He's the head or prince of Rosh and Meshech and Tuval. That, these are all names that I can get to you, the sources from Josephus service all the way even before that describe Russia of today. Ladies and gentlemen, God says, I have something against you, Gog. I will turn you, put a hook in your jaw, and I will bring you all the way to the land. And I will deal with you. And not only you, with you, he said, there will be others such as Persia, which is modern day Iran of today. And with you, even Gomer and the house of Togarma, which is modern day Turkey of today. And he even says, also, Kush will join you. The Kush in the Hebrew language is Sudan of today. Although some of your Bible translation says Ethiopia. And he says even Libya. The word Libya is mentioned. None of these countries have any border with Israel. Notice, this is not, this is not a war that Israel had like in 48, in 67, 73 with its neighbors. No, this is a war that is not the neighbors of Israel against Israel. It's a war of a coalition that comes to a safe, prosperous, and secured country to take and to steal that which it has. Very interesting. And Ezekiel does not stop here. He even mentions Sheba and Dedan, which is the biblical name of Saudi Arabia of today. And the Bible in Ezekiel 38 says that that country will protest the war. It's not going to be part of the attackers, but part of those who protest against it. Have you been watching TV lately? Hmm? Joe Biden has COVID. No, 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 that's not what I wanted to say. <laughs> I mean, now all the kings and the princes there must go and do a COVID test because he shook their hands. But I do want you to know, Saudi Arabia, as of last week, opened its airspace for the first time in its history to Israeli planes. Quite amazing. It also mentions the merchants of Tarshish. Tarshish is the biblical Old Testament name for Spain, but also it's a generic name for Western Europe. And it also mentions something interesting, and the young lions of Tarshish, which some scholars believe it's probably the new country that came out of Europe in the last 200, almost 300 years, that could be the United States of America. And all of them, Saudi, the Europeans, or even the Americans, if it is America, all of them protest 
Now, what are countries doing nowadays when they see that Russia invaded into Ukraine? Protest. <laughs> they protest. <laughs> Did Russia leave Ukraine? Absolutely not. Is Russia advancing in Ukraine? Absolutely. Is Putin about to die? Absolutely not. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what we see now is the <laughs> precursor. We're watching how the world is going to react and behave when this war is coming to pass. How many of you heard of Syria? Everyone. If I, if I asked you 12 years ago, half of you would not know where it even it's on the map. Not, uh, not you, okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to hurt your feelings. In other parts of the world, they wouldn't know. Certainly not in PE. But if you remember a few years ago, someone with orange hair in the White House <laughs> cut a deal and brought a peace accord that is unparalleled of Israel with four different countries. First it was with the UAE and Bahrain, then Morocco and Sudan were added. And it was on the lawn of the White House with Netanyahu and with President Trump, if you can move, and you can clearly see, and was he given anything? Any Nobel Peace Prize for the only peace that works in the Middle East? No, other presidents were only two months in the White House receiving a Nobel Peace Prize for doing nothing. Look, from one administration to another, the person in the White House affects the Middle East. One is decisive and can bring peace, and now another one is undecisive and it can bring war. And we watch it. President Trump, we know, has peace with four new countries, at least three others have either formally recognized Israel or even open embassy there. Arabs and Jews are cooperating nowadays in level we've never seen before. A White House that holds the Middle East accountable results in less violence. That's why you hit ISIS, you hit the head of the snake in Iran, and you punish those that are perpetrating terrorism. And I'm not advocating for him, just so you know. I could care less. I advocate for the word of God. And I don't care who is the president and what his name, what his hair color, and how he's talking. But I can tell you that one brought stability and the other one was bringing instability. And both God allowed. And both were needed in order for Ezekiel to come to pass. For Saudi Arabia to protest, we need peace with them. <laughs> but for the instable, unstable Middle East to start a war, we need someone else. God did not fall off his chair when Biden entered into the White House. I want to tell you also for you, and I really feel for you, Whatever you think about your government or whatever, remember God has allowed it. And remember one thing, God is still on the throne. And remember one thing, many times, many times, it is the best way to purify a nation. Hardships have always been the best thing for the church. When everything goes well, people forget about God. There is a verse in the Bible that describes Israel, and it says, Vayashmen Yeshurun Vayivat. And Jeshurun, which is another name for Israel, grew fat, which means spoiled, and he started kicking God out. So what's next? The classic Christian confusion. Christian loves to mix Salad of prophecies. They take things out of context. Who needs context? <laughs> they love clickbaits. They love to scare people. They're at the ministry of anxiety. 
Ladies and gentlemen, there's a lot of prophecies in the Bible that are falling under the definition of things that have not yet done. Okay? Psalm 83, for example, I believe it has happened already. Because it's a psalm that describes the war of the neighboring countries, how they wanted to cut us off from being a nation, and how God managed to defeat them. It's, it's done. We don't have a problem. You understand? Jordan has peace with us. Egypt has peace with us. And Lebanon and Syria don't function anymore as a sovereign countries. But I believe that what Isaiah wrote in chapter 17 regarding the destruction of Damascus, it's something that falls under the definition of things to come. It says, behold, the burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Take a look at what Damascus looked like today. It's a huge thriving city. It has never, since the time it was built, it has never been completely destroyed. It is this longest standing city in the world. Excuse me, the longest, and yeah, obviously oldest. Yeah, here it is. It's not yet been destroyed yet. I believe that when this city is going to be destroyed, Ezekiel 38 would come to pass. Because everybody's fingers will be pointing at Israel. We are the generation that has been watching the transition from a country that was just born and survived the wars of independence, six days war in Yom Kippur, to a country that is safe, secure, and prosperous. And now Ezekiel 38 is coming around the corner. We've watched this transition. We are no longer a nation that can, you know, be afraid that tomorrow we won't make it because some neighbor... He's going to do something. Psalm 83 fulfilled. But Ezekiel 38 says, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog. Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of what? Rosh and Meshach and Tuval. I will turn you around and hook into your jaws and lead you out with all your armies. And he says, Persia and Ethiopia and Libya and Gomer and the house of Togomer, many people are with you. Now, you know that Russia invaded into Ukraine, and you're probably saying, what do I need to talk about that? Well, it affected everything, because right now, the world is trying to run away from Russia, and from the Russian gas, and from the Russian oil, and guess who becomes the darling of Europe? <laughs> that same EU that couldn't wait to condemn us every day, everywhere, suddenly we are good. Oh, let's sign a deal with you. Amazing. Folks, whether it's peace or whether it's war, God is in control. And I want to tell you something. Luke 21 says, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads because your redemption draws near. <laughs> Now, before you clap, first of all, we're all redeemed already. So how come our redemption is drawing near? It's the redemption of our body, as Romans 8 says. Look at yourself. No, really, truly, seriously. Look at yourself right now. Pinch yourself. You're dying. Except for some of you here that you haven't made it to 18 yet. The minute you make it to 18, you start dying. All of us, put a picture of yourself from 20 years ago, put it next to you right now. You're dying. You can work out five times a week, Botox, Motox, whatever you want. You're dying. Folks, let me tell you something. We have a tent and God wants to give us a building, the Bible says. For that to happen, we need to change. For that to happen, he needs to take us out of here. That's the redemption that is drawing near. Everything that is happening all around the world is pointing at one thing. Jesus is coming soon to take us out of here. How are you? I'm okay. Saved by grace. Well, the joy of the Lord is not your strength. 
Folks, we should be the most hopeful and joyful people in the world. When the world is looking at us, he needs to see people that knows that their redemption is drawing near. The rapture is the redemption of the body. Some of us might still be alive. Some of us might be asleep. That's the word for if you die as a believer. We're not really dead. We just change address. You go to bed. You fall asleep in the living room and you wake up in your bed. You are in the presence of the Lord. And trust me, we might miss you, but you won't miss us. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, just to conclude, I will just tell you this. Remember what those two disciples did when they realized that Jesus is alive. After they themselves warned him not, not to go because it's too dangerous to walk at night. Stay with us. Let's eat together and all of that. When he vanished and Jesus vanished, there's sometimes rapture sideways, not only upwards. <laughs> Jesus disappeared. And they did not say, oh, I don't think it's biblical. A rapture, no, it's not in the Bible. Come on. The Bible is not in the Bible. <laughs> Listen to me. The two disciples, when they realize that he's alive, the same night, turn around and ran back to Jerusalem. If they way down to Emmaus with a walk of shame and confusion and guilt and embarrassment, they run back to Jerusalem is a run of hope and victory. We need to run that race. We need to fight that good fight and we need to keep our faith. And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now our salvation the salvation of our body is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. From today, if you are not happy, if you are not amazingly crazy for Jesus, then you've got a problem. Jesus is coming soon and he wants to find us doing his father's business. And he wants to find us happy, satisfied, ready to be taken. Look, when was the last time a bride about to see the bridegroom is like, <laughs> I don't want to get out of bed. At least brush your teeth or something. No, no, no. We must be like a bride ready. Put so much money on your makeup and your hair and your dress. How about put all the effort you can to be like the bride before the bridegroom come to take us. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And we ask you to sanctify us by your truth. We're not here to play or to pass time or to just be part of this world. Father, we thank you that we are not just citizens of the heavenlies already, but we are ambassadors of Christ here on earth. We thank you for the plans that you have for us. We thank you for what you did and still are doing with Israel. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness to your people that is such a beautiful picture of your faithfulness to all of us. We thank you, Father, and we bless your name, and we ask that in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, 
the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Emmanuel, Prince of Peace, in the name of the one who is the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of his people Israel. In the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Thanks so much. Was that tremendous? Yeah. Amen. Amen. We just want to say thank you, Lord, for, for these folk that came here, that sacrificed to come all the way to South Africa. And um, I just want to thank all the people that came here tonight. How many people from out of town? Can I see by a raise of hands? Wow, that's incredible. Bless you for coming, man. Um, the other thing is, just to let you know, we've got some people here from Oslo, Norway, too. And, uh, yeah, that's tremendous. And, I, you know, I just want to thank Pastor uh, uh, Jeffrey, uh, um, Richard Crompton, and his team. I think it's been tremendous the way they put this on tonight. And I'm sure you all agree with me. And, uh, and all the, the other churches that got involved with the organization, thank you for doing that in Jesus' name. And we just want to... We want to be a blessing to this ministry. And folks, we're going to have an offering now. And 